e tomit balia le kele tronona con kilura a yana fagas con buik sa gual mornosum le gluin na revloja ki ad vlino hen. Gluin a chred is a liag tovogt ar an dianga, an dianga huart slorn, agas rinnishiad an meid a vila dianaf aca le digrishgas le durogt. Agas mwytin sia e borg ni adhenia, kwef ni meid ga hoirahe Er yn mrawdig podryg mag fyrish tan tianga isia. Er yn gion sil yr un isie, cyn yn tianga a a nuk yn agos ilianw. Er yn spes y fiaga i nos frog sil yn oel, a fwyn leis yn tianga. Agos er a larnach ta fi yn tianga sy togr y cian rwydiog iddig is, a cwyr si y griag sy nôt yn y wylym wyd yn is. Ta mwyd fwy gymyn dy glwyn yn y hafiocna, Da var na fisha ve aka, agus da var na haibra e rinnishiad, kun an ishin a vwynt amak, mar tara er ik nifra. Han i gnehe shin an kultur slan, agus as mor agin ya sana me loheriad, mar ahant as is me lero er kultur na neil. Tishkin ter vitja sa gsa star fwile, ar krihi gailaka, ar rata shun luk vart litriagta, agus ar dranka. E kakad mar sha, Is fiw beidr sgrwd o cwnsios ar yn meid y ta ien y fag yn ffein? Er institiwt ys na dyn i y gydion, cawl mwyd y ian o cwn yn aer y gysio a hlan nhw. Fi yn pyrs ac yn ar i'r e ffyn tiangan, agos yn slu a bar cwn o'n i y fwna agos e'r cor cwn cyn. Ni gan ddoa na gan digrys y honig na gnehys yn slyta ag yn slan hogyn. Eg tusum pwyna hysia sy'n cacha, fi an gailia ar an dia dierag ag ysgan da phobl a la o'r tawtraint, da lw phobl o'r cost an deskert ag ys an eher. Ti'n pwy cwyng fwy'n gheed da phas ti ti fwy fwy'n deflyna. Fi an eisiau mar galian an gorta war ag banu na tuwe, ag ys lagu a bioogta. Fi slanu na gailia fitin me yn mwel, fres yn tis na grif an gailia, Mae'r cwyd y corys na sgylion yn asiwnta, nad y corys rwy'r y cain na breathna. Tysgr sawl i ag yn gailgia leis yn mochtan ys, ag ys tysg yn ffawn y fi ar gwylio'r tys mohori, a fi gailgia aca o'n berle fwna da gwyd lenni, o'n ys gofed y tys a posta oel sna bal chymora ag ys America. Ta'r eich bad yn America a hogan. Ba hysgynt, er yn rwyachtan ys y fi an yn nos yn y sin, a cas ar y gian, mae'r ein leis yn speis y fil loc lein yn cwrs y tiang a bwchwys lafonw con yn y gailgia, sy'n flin octioch no cytri. Agriach da mi octo lwf wynt ake, le glwysioch da afioch yn y gailgia. Hon eich bora os cwym sy'r con yn y gailgia, eich tuis yn ceich a cacha. Cwyr gynifwch ti'n cynconyrha, go mor leis yn seil sosial da mal chy mora, agos eich rhoed falch yn y tira. Bwyn y glas as yn gyl, as yn dawsa, as yn dramiacht, cyn tacwyl y lahan o'n y gweilgia. Fi yn eirish ta hiang ac eirish lan y gweilgia, ac as yn nŵoch ta'n ffan yn le, lan dy sgryf yn i o'n y lehedi o'n doctor o hiki, o'n mag neil, agnes o ffarele, meri hedyn, ac as gan efra stuglis dy hyd a'n cryf yn eithyn. Er sgalor a cianrwyd i'r gweilgia os filioch de, ac os ochtron yn cynhyrra o octioch no cytri gynnydd i sicwtioch. Hwg padryg ma ffyrish le cynhyrna gweilgia symlein octioch no cysie. Gan siach mlyn y deog a fe slan hage, ac os cwrs y cynhau bryd gyd digr sy'n gysglo dwrochtoch, sy'n ade mlyn yn i eich sin. Drast yr sy, er ffordd o'r goclyn o dy cwyd yn coes dy gynnoha, Fwn si'r rang yn y gweilgia, hag si'r leidd y leoch te ag ys cyant cyntyna. Fi si'r ffol dy creif yr be o'n cynnau'n e rhef ŵr lorri i ffigwyl dy i o'r he, eidr i'n mla clia ag ys las mwyde. Ag ys o'n blin neud i'r cyd, stiwri gan ffyr si'r cwys dy ffail si'r cynnau'n cynnau. Ag ys y blin neud i'r sy'r tri, glag si'r hwyge ag yr horoch ten claif solis. Rôl y coelun si la ffawn ag ys le ffagat gyn cion breis le sheib le anna. De ac yn pyrs y cwige gymio ag spas nag biog sy'n lega niwa. Meid dyha, 
on meidhead and clive the litriuk na gaelge agas e marcha er heax in a classic na gaelge a corer is sulit and fobble marin the litriuk no i'm sure kdukusa a spraga quinan buinche vegan bersak la kana na gaelge guithna doin gor sok dianak in a hail a hagan piersak fe na shuna kas pulichul shakas and na shuna kas kultur Ola sen yanta jarma da rori vi selle linisha. E fan om lenta fata, vi padrig mag perish toka ka humlanus got fun for dan gaelge, agas da vi oka na gaelge. Maragot she fein, nilon lusik na gaelge gan avres, a quid den glusik na shunta, a kasean quid as tovak di di de, an quid a hagan brigas ko lanunakas den umlan. Farak alo din el elie nusik na gaelge gan aam, Hiaste gan pyrsak le carlin a quid gulge. Carlin a gulge efe fein, as da var san hag se kurt er an nueltag te gominig. Bo uur an spreag as an sasaf a fwynse, as an keet saura kasha er aren. Aat ar hasasche eg fawl na gulge bio, o keet muntor John Millington sing. Fi kyan fe lehege er gulge te nirer e fa ha sil, Agus ba in se spreag a suvnisg goi, agus chaeag se'r cwrt a'n, trin o cer a bawt a syflian. Ba war o'n dafy fi eg o'n pyrsag la canamara a cohorahe. Agus ba la canunt goelga canamara o hwysche. Fi se fe iasa eg tirdrach agus eg mwyd a ras mwg. Ceantr a ta sitio a lais lid ar galiaf agus yn cloc o'n. Hwysche a'n dan ceidw ar sym lian neid agus a tri. Agus heag se an gach saur in iesion. Bas a tiach in cian ti a dog se do fein, er vruig lag i rúlach a skrip oedrig ma fyrish, on oraid a mrachach sin a hag se ag sacred gwyrmid a gunaf an rasa i mi lúnas a nidis a fift i cwytiach. Is farast a da skrinor i cwamsire, cyn ol i dielach as eichal sa tôr a fyg an pyrsa gyr aileacht, agus ar ianacht mwynt an agatach. A chi'n sgrin o'r y ddiolau hyd, na'r hog yn pyrstach i gart, o'n jarog fwcht yn agos ys yn nim ni'r efgorra, a hog ar gyliwr di'n i dal yr ymyr cao i'r yn y herin. Ioga bo o'r o'n dîl intis do e, na'r lord yn y ddyn i sy'n, cwyfn yn aerog ta o'r hwyl a ffein. Bwe a hiast y gond pyrstach, go gweryd i sy'n tlu marog ta o'r fi ac o'n anion yn fwcht yn ys, a fi gard, sêl a fi gard yn nadwr, Agus lan di hi rúlacht, e gambrod le ne veg maraktal er imel sucke ir a vach agus tion skiriach. Ni mor du in ehen salat an yo an, gare podrach ma firis kian rodiach o hef kasant na gailge, mar van kamersadje, shakas mar yel spesia mas loc lein, o hef rôl fobl na gailtech te slán ar gailge bio, agus oed na spesia viage sa da hiangakas. Hwig a sin ni mor cwyfna na'r aachig yn pyrs y gryf, gyma ag eire yn y tîr e'n tiang a gweilge, ac yr efsulage gan mwyn fi eire ag da'r hiang a cymach. Agos eg jyn efti agart da'r hiang a hiang a cys liana me pys a eg yn pwynt a sio i merla. I think that today we must recognise that Patrick Pierce was visionary in his defence of the language as a spoken living medium, rather than a mere object of scholarly interest. In his insistence on the role of the Geltic people in ensuring the survival of this living language, as well as his interest in bilingualism, in that regard it is important to remember that Pierce never advocated for a, a, an old Irish-speaking Ireland, monolingual Ireland, but hope rather for a bilingual Ireland. What I have just been saying in Irish, because it is important at this point, I think, to recognize why we are here, to pay tribute to that generation of which Patrick Pierce is such an important part. Here in St. Indus Park, we recall what Patrick Pierce and his colleagues did for the Irish language. I'm particularly pleased that so many of the McLaughlins are here, knowing as I do, and I want to wish him so well for his 90th birthday, Alf McLaughlin, dear, dear friend, and writer, and librarian, and scholar. I have acknowledged the, what we owe to the generation of the revival, 
and I have suggested that they lay down a challenge for us to examine in conscience what we are in fact doing with that capacity that they left us to speak not one language but many languages and whether or not we are implementing their vision, be it at the level of personal level, at the level of institutions or with those with special responsibility for the language. And it's on a day like today that we should put this examination of conscience in place and ask why is it so that we perceive obstacles to speaking Irish regularly and fully and regularly in our way. I've also made reference to the importance, if you like, of the contributions that were made to the different journals in which Pierce was involved. It is very interesting to think of this young man, not yet 17, who not only joins Conrad and Gaelia, but attends every single meeting of its business committee. I think as well, in editing in Clive Solish, which is such, with, with great zeal as he did, was of such an important contribution. And I think as well where he saw the language movement as part of a national movement. And then, of course, there is the romanticism of his relationship to the West of Ireland, starting with the same teacher as, had, as had John Millington Singh had in, in the Iron Islands, and his regular retreat to Rossmoke, where he would compose the oration at the, for the graveside of O'Donovan Rossa. And I also said as well that I think it's a false dichotomy to suggest that Pierce was uh, ignored the Bokhtanus, the sheer poverty of the people of Connemara. He was doing his utmost with the materials that were left to him after the oppression that was there against the language, both of an economic kind and of a state kind that devalued the language. Pierce's interest in bilingual education that I have referred to was first during a trip he made to Wales in 1899 to attend a pan-Celtic gathering. And then this deepened over the month he spent in Belgium in July 1905 to study the French and Flemish bilingual system of education. It's worth bearing in mind in that year, 1905, in that same year, Douglas the Heath and his wife we set off for six months and visit 54 major cities in the United States, collecting 10,000 pounds for the Conrad Agrega. And they would be attended by people who were Irish speaking these meetings, some of them as much as 7,000 people present talking about the language, a language that had been driven abroad. Pierce was partic Patrick Pierce was particularly taken by from these meetings he attended by the so-called direct method, a technique of language teaching through conversation that was widely in use in the continental schools. And in the columns of Unclive Salish, Pierce tirelessly advocated for this bilingualism to be operated throughout the country, but not just, and not just in the Gaelic areas. In the proposals he set out in 1906, he not only stated that every child has a right to be taught his mother tongue, but also that every child ought to be taught at least one other language as soon as he is capable of learning it. The modernity of Pierce's defense of bilingualism, his grasp of language acquisition and classroom practice are elements that point to the deep relevance of his legacy as an educator. And while his education a little thought and work has not always garnered all the attention it deserves. It is appropriate that we today in these premises recall the achievements of Patrick Pierce as an educational theorist, as a teacher, and the founder of what was one of Ireland's most innovative schools in the early 20th century. Even if their rising had never taken place, Patrick Pierce would have carved out a name for himself in revolutionary consciousness for his educational theory and his pedagogy. I often think of the difference of that kind of vision and a strategy like asking all of the civil servants to change their names into Irish, which was a, a strategy of the 1930s but more of that on another day. Frustrated by the failure of his ideas for educational reform to gain wide traction amongst his contemporaries, 
Pierce characteristically resolved to take the matter into his own hands. He was determined to, mon to demonstrate the possibility of an alternative model of schooling by opening his own school, one where a bilingual environment would be created, where pupils would be made aware of Irish history and where each child's individuality would be cherished. Convinced that schooling in Ireland amounted to an act of cultural assimilation and indeed the provision of education under British rule betrayed an agenda of cultural, religious and linguistic assimilation. Pierce wanted his school to have an Irish standpoint and atmosphere, and he based on what he saw as two characteristics of the old Irish system of education, freedom for the individual student and inspirational teaching. In the Casula in Spiritual, Pierce was also anxious to restore an awareness of the value of the Irish past. Now, this concern of his, I think, is sometimes neglected in the very contemporary accounts. One must understand what he and others were up against. It is hard to believe that at the dawn of the Enlightenment, it was argued that the Irish were too backward to have been the location, for example, for the origin of any myth. This is a view, for example, held by James Macpherson. An extreme example for such views was provided by David Hume in his History of England, 1754 to 1762. The Irish from the beginning of time had been buried in the most profound barbarism and ignorance. And as they were never conquered or even invaded by the Romans, from whom all the Western world derived its civility, they continued still in the most rude state of society and were distinguished by those vices alone to which human nature not tamed by education or restrained by laws is forever subject. I think as we all move on, it is important to recognize the cultural degradation that is at the heart of the imperialist project. And of course, not only in Ireland, but everywhere, it has made its violent ingress. Scalenia St. Enders, the school which opened its doors in Collinswood House Rat Mines in 1908, took its name from the patron saint of Pierce's beloved Aaron. It attracted many pupils from prominent national fam families, and three sons and a nephew of Owen McNeil, a son of William Bolfin, a son of W.P. Ryan, Agnes O'Farrelly, Mary Hayden, Stephen Barrett, John T. O'Kelly, Padraig Cullen. I think it had so many, it sought. These families were interested in what Pierce was attempting, teaching a love of Irish history, language, literature, and poetry. He also sought to cultivate in those boys a mixture of virtue and valour by telling them of the life of the early Irish saints, such as Enda and Cullum Kill, and of the great deeds of the heroes of Ireland's mythical cycles, such as Cucullan and Fionn. Now, remember it had been argued just a short a century previously that the Irish couldn't be intelligent enough to have ever been the origin of a myth. According to Desmond Ryan, a former pupil of St. Enders, who later became Pierce's secretary as well as one of his biographers, the boys were so taken by the Cucullan saga, which Pierce distilled to them day after day, that the dark, sad boy became an important member of staff. St. Indus pupils did not just triumph from the hurling and football fields of Dublin and Leinster. They also starred on the stage of the Abbey Theatre, attracting glowing reports in the nationalist press. St. Indus' finest dramatic production, for which the boys joined forces with the girls of their sister school, St. Eta's, was a passion play that was shown in the Abbey in Holy Week 1911 and which some have read signs of the events that were to come five years later. Pierce's sense of theatre, romantic, his romantic imagination, both of which have been extremely vivid from childhood, found vast room for expression in these St. Enders plays. Through them he breathed new life in the mythical figures of his youth, many of whom had been fed to him by his octogenarian grand-aunt Margaret, who was his link to his mother's county meat culture, and who had fascinated him with her stories and tales not only about Fionn, Tone and Emmet, but also of Napoleon. The photographs of St. Enders' youths, dressed up as early Irish saints and heroes, 
enjoyed widespread dissemination amongst the cultural revivalist circles. Those images emblematized, if you like, the contemporary hopes for a national future that would draw its strength and inspiration from Ireland's great past. But they were not simply invocations of what had been past. They were imaginings about what a future Ireland would be, an Irish Ireland. Yet Patrick Pierce's educational project was much broader than any nationalist agenda. His description of schooling in Ireland as a murder machine, the title of his famous 1916 essay, refers not only to the use of education as an agent of colonialism that instilled an ignorance of their own past and self-hatred in Irish pupils. It also referred, and this was harder for many to take, to the pedagogical poverty that was prevalent at the time and that would last for so many decades needlessly. The scholars who have studied Pierce's educational work, such as Seamus O'Bokla or more recently Brendan Walsh and Nilene Sison, have hi all highlighted Pierce's commitment to a child-centered education, where each pupil is encouraged to de develop the best of her or his unique potential. Pierce was virulent in his denunciation of the repressive spirit of Ireland's intermediate system, for example, which, in his view, crushed the individuality of pupils by imposing on them a brutal discipline, a narrow curriculum, and a rigid results-oriented system of examination. I often ask myself, where did all this authoritarianism I sometimes encounter come from? What are its origins? I think the answer is in Patrick Pierce to some extent. He saw it. To him, this system was but instruction without education, which he described, it grinds day and night. It obeys immutable and predetermined laws. It is as devoid of understanding of sympathy, of imagination, as in any other piece of machinery that performs an appointed task. Into it is fed all the raw material in Ireland. It seizes upon it inexorably and rends and compresses and remoulds. And what it cannot refashion after the regulation pattern, it ejects with all the likeness of its former self crushed from it, a bruised and shapeless thing, there and after accounted waste. Pierce, this great educationalist, recognized the existence of different kinds of intelligence, as is revealed in this small episode he related in one of his speeches, we can find it in Our Freedom in Education, 1912. I know not the boy of whom his father said to me, he's no good with books. He's no good at work. He's good at nothing but playing a tin whistle. What am I to do with him? I shocked the worthy man by replying, though really it was the obvious thing to reply, buy a tin whistle for him. Thus in St. Enders, alongside the classical subjects, Great attention was granted to the modern subjects and science, as well as to the development of artistic and sporting skills, to the study of nature and the love of animals. The only child ever expelled was sent home because of cruelty to a cat. I think it's also these, these emphases, if you like, were all aimed at the formation of moral character. According to Brendan Walsh, Pierce also prepared his boys to be future citizens of an independent Ireland by the cultivation of democratic participation in the life of the school. Importantly, the school was embellished by the work of such well-known artists as Beatrice Elvery and Sarah Parser, as well as by original pictures by Jack B. Yeats and George Russell, friezes by Edwin and Jack Morrow, and sculptures by Willie Pierce and others. True to his conviction, as he put it, it is only by making his own life a thing of grace and beauty that the teacher will gain the happiness of seeing successive generations of good men and women go up around him. Patrick Pierce endeavoured to recruit the best of teachers thus for his pupils. His right-hand man during his first years at St. Enders was Thomas McDonough, a poet and playwright whose infectious cheerfulness infused the school with a gaiety and laughter that were in stark contrast with the gloomy silences imposed in many Irish schools of the time. Another central figure 
in the life of St. Indus boys was the gardener, Michal Macruri, a native speaker of Irish who was also a folklorist and the winner of several Oireachtas medals. There was a resident master in charge of dancing, music and athletics, Tomás McGonnell, a, a well-known musician. And then in, in the first year, scholars such as Michael Smithick, a, leag a leaguer and a mathematician, came, as did the Irish harpist Owen Lyde, and Dr. Patrick Doody taught classics. For us today, it is impressive how eminent intellectual figures of the era, they came and went to dispense what Pierce had called his half-holiday lectures. They included with w William Butler Yeats, Douglas Hyde, Patrick Cullum, Standish O'Grady, Edward Martin, Agnes O'Farrell, Owen McNeil, Alice Stopford Green, and Roger Casement, who spoke to the boys about the importance of the Irish revival and gave a present an impressive penknife as a prize for the author of the best essay in Irish. Here at the Hermitage, Pierce, Pierce St. Indes, of course, wasn't sufficient in terms of space, as he was concerned. But St. Indus was also, we should never forget, and it's important, the family home of the Pierces, all of whom took an active part in the school. This was in conformity with Pierce's interest in the old Gaelic institution of fosterage and his belief that the school environment should be a nurturing one. Willie, who had studied at the Metropolitan School of Art, taught art at the school. Mrs. Pierce acted as matron and housekeeper. Mary Bridget taught music, and Margaret taught junior French, as well as keeping a correspondence with the pupils when they went on holidays. And St. Indus moved then from Collinswood House to this beautiful 18th century house known as the Hermitage in the foothills of the Dublin Mountains, it was financially disastrous for the Pierces, as well as marking a sharp decline in the number of enrolled pupils. This move, of course, also marked the beginning of Patrick Pierce's contemplation of physical force as the best path to Ireland's freedom. After all, I think you already when we're seeing a whole generation being got ready to, to be wasted in war in Europe. Here at the Hermitage, Pierce became particularly interested in the figure of Robert Emmett, who had reportedly walked these grounds with Sarah Curran. He also immersed himself in the writings of other revolutionaries, particularly Wolfe Tone's autobiography and John Mitchell's jail journal, as well as the work of the young islanders Thomas Davis and James Fenton Lawler. But Patrick Pierce did not just spend his time reading and teaching and daydreaming during his walks around the park. Over the very short period, from June 1913 to February 1914, he, became, he acted. He was a co-founder of the Irish Volunteers, joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and developing a new social awareness in the face of the brutality of the Great Lockout. He also came closer to the two giants of the Irish labour movement, James Larkin, whose two sons attended St. Enders, and James Connolly, whose intellectual stature greatly impressed Patrick Pierce, particularly after the Lockout of 1913 had brought them closer together. The American tour Pierce undertook in early 1914 brought him into contact with radical Irish American Fenians, such as John Devoy and Joseph McGarrity, and this only strengthened his conviction of the necessity for military action to achieve Irish independence. We've had ample opportunity during this centennial year to recall the unfolding of the Easter Rising of 1916 and the prominent part that Pierce played in it. For all of us Irish people, the name of Patrick Pierce remains associated with the proclamation of the Irish Republic, for Oig Republic Naheran, of which he was the main drafter as well as a signatory, and which he read out from under the porch of the GPO shortly after noon on Easter Monday, 1916. Pierce was very aware of being part of a wider tradition of Irish armed rebellion. And while his exaltation of bloodshed and sacrifice as a means to regenerate the nation is sometimes misconstrued nowadays, recent scholarship has shown that such rhetoric was in widespread use. 
in keeping with the language of European nationalist discourse a century ago, but particularly also in the aggressive tone of army recruitment propaganda in those early years of World War I, which invoked patriotism as the shedding of blood for empire. World War I was, after all, we must never forget, a contest, a dreadful catastrophic contest between six imperial powers. Elaine Seeson and her recent work has argued that Patrick Pierce's appeals to the manhood of the Irish nation were largely a translation into the Irish context of the imperial values of masculinity and warfare that had such wide currency at the time. It seems to me that Patrick Pierce was, just, was likely also to have been attracted to the aesthetic battle between friends, pre present that, is not, that was not just there in the Finneach saga, but also in the European classics with which he was familiar. I think, for example, of the contest between Nisus and Euryalus in Virgil's Aeneid. It would take year, four years of the most very real and massive bloodshed in the trenches of France and Belgium to teach that generation of which of Pierce that the time that total the total in time that total war is a horrendous thing. It would not be sufficient to stop a second world war, and a heroic, of course, would be crafted for the militarism that lay at its heart. Patrick Pierce did not live to reflect back on those devastating years in the history of Europe. Court martialed for his leadership in the Rising. He was shot at 3.30 a.m. on the 3rd of May, 1916, at Kilmenham Jail. His friend and fellow schoolmaster at St. Enders, Thomas X. McDonough, was executed on the same day. Willie Pierce died the following day, and Con Colbert, who had been employed at St. Enders as a drilling instructor, was executed on the 8th of May. There is a moving account in Clive Salish of the people of Ratfarnham, approaching Margaret Pierce, mother of her two executed sons, after Mass on the first Sunday after these executions, and the dignity that was associated with her conversations with her neighbours. As ended by the last section of this museum's new permanent exhibition, diligently curated by Brian Crowley, Padre Pierce's post-mortem life also proved to be an eventful one. While Pierce was an uncontested figure in Ireland up to the 1966 anniversary, an anniversary that had not got as far as recognising the role of women and many others, but in 1970, for example, de Valera accepted the keys of St. Enders, Eamon de Valera, on behalf of the Irish state. Pierce's legacy became the focus then of some tendentious writings in the subsequent decades. In the context of what has been called the Troubles, loose revisionism sought to make the suggestion that Pierce had provided the ideological template for the Republican violence of 1969 and later. This was, of course, a simplistic and ideological assumption, and contemporary historians are more interested in the human rights breaches, the political and social and economic exclusions that were the base of conflict as a source of violence in Northern Ireland of the 1970s. A hundred years on, we can see so much better behind the icon that we have invented. We are better able to be moved by the exceptional quality of the affection which united Patrick Pierce with the other members of his family, in particular his mother Margaret and his brother Willie, of whom Patrick said, as a boy he was my only playmate, as a man he has been my only intimate friend. And I know that this is a dimension of Pierce's life that is especially meaningful to the members of the Pierce family who I'm so pleased are with us here today and whom I salute. A century later, we are too more open to acknowledging the deep sensitivity which underpinned Pierce's sense of his own identity. For example, we know now that Pierce's habit of offering his profile to photographers a tendency ironically conducive to future icon, icon, icon usage, stemmed in fact from his self-consciousness about the pitosis that he had in his eye from early childhood. 
Pierce has also a biography of which the original is disp and display in the new permanent exhibition that we will open today. Demonstrate Pierce's remarkable awareness of his own complexity. As a man who is passionate about Ireland's old myths, but also had a deep interest in modernity in all its aspects. As a defender of the Irish language, who greatly admired English literature, Milton, and above all, in Shakespeare. And as the son of a mixed marriage between an Irish woman and an Englishman, he wrote, These true traditions worked in me, and fused together by a certain fire proper to myself, made me. With, and, and I think he said, the strange thing that I am. Is more in source of a hagan shadam sinu maruk tarana herin. An buik as a thought til chek padrig mach dirish ex a thirak as namana. A rai birik chek a digras a globe. O in marnash yun a kari new loss and gyan a renishe. Enos gan wenig star na noel. Litriak na noel. Agas an gail gyan aht a vi dilich a dub a mach is gail yun a thira. Mar a der gane da vahash nesha an fyrsig. Gar hagan gluin shin de gniva ha kaltur. Akarun thin vasa dan gailga. Agus as mora glin e shin. Is arinitan dulgas e o usait. It is my great pleasure as President of Ireland to express the debt of gratitude that we as a nation owe to Patrick Pierce and the women and men alongside who we work tirelessly so that Irish history, literature and our Irish language would gain the place they deserve in our schools. As one of his biographers put it, that generation of cultural activists gave the key, gave the Irish people the key to self-respect, and we are immensely grateful for that. And it is for us to use that key. In Ishina Gwerter Glor Gneha Dach Dirkandina, on Tilta Kasagas Kamas Tiang and a mask, Egorer Lisprik Ilagwalak on Tishkelagrig, is more again fresh. Kun kapi dialog nev urlishak natyangan, agus anitak is of run and gloon crano diak urin. Gadog in a hokaji komorisha, desh duin quid on it nelakas, jarafa kahort slon, mar rod and gloon raha, agus on a gloon ta fosa tolichiat. In an age when so many spheres of human achievement, including education and language proficiency in it, are too often placed in a utilitarian relationship to the overarching goal of economic efficiency. Maybe we always be grateful for the idealistic, non-instrumental conception of language and education, which that revolutionary generation bequeathed to us, and the inspirational ideas of Patrick Pierce, not just as revolutionary, but revolutionary theorist and practitioner in education. So may these commemorations be an opportunity to salvage something of their positive idealism to guide us through our present and into our future. Garamila Mahake, thank you.